two past three o'clock Paris time. Welcome everybody. My name is Michael Claude. I'm the head of communications of the International Transport Forum. I'll be, I'll be your host, which basically means I won't say much. What I'll say is it's great to have you all here. Uh, we have about 30 minutes. This is a short and quick and pithy format, to, so you get the most of it in, in a short period of time. We'll split these 30 minutes into 10 minutes presentation and 20 minutes for your questions. Um, for your questions, please use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Click on that and you can type in your question and our author will do his very, very best to answer them. Um, the author we have with us today is uh, Pier Paolo Casola, who is uh, the um, advisor for energy, technology and environmental sustainability at the International Transport Forum. And he is also the lead author of our latest report uh, called Standards and Regulations for Clean Trucks and Buses. This was published last week and perhaps one of the reasons you're here is because you uh, seen that it has been published and you already had a sneak preview of and have some questions. Um, it's in any case download and what the report does is it reviews progress on technical standards that will help to um, move trucks and buses towards becoming zero or at least low emission vehicles. And that is really a key question for transport because uh, road freight is the fastest growing emitter. 80% of the global net increase in diesel use since 2000 comes from road freight. At the same time, one could argue that it is relatively low on the policy agenda. And this is, I think, where this report comes in. So without further ado, I'll hand over to, to Pia Paolo to take us through the uh, findings and recommendations of this report. And then in about 10 minutes, we'll switch to questions. You can, during the session, type in your questions, I'll collect them and we'll work our way through them. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, over to you, Pia Paolo. Thanks, Michael, and hi, everyone. Uh, so I'll try to walk you through quickly the key findings and key recommendations of the report. Um, so first, let me say a couple of words about uh, why we worked on this um, and what it is about. So the, the idea was to look at uh, regulations and standards for technologies that enable low or near zero emissions for the specific case of heavy vehicles. So when you say low and zero, near zero emission, we mean battery, plug-in hybrids, or fuel, fuel cell electric vehicles. So essentially electric or hydrogen trucks and buses. Um, well, we looked at different aspects of regulations and standards that cover safety, uh, charging and refueling infrastructure, and uh, environmental performance and energy use. Uh, the reason for this is that these are new technologies and uh, the, there is a safety element in it, uh, in, in, the, in the introduction of new technologies. Um, which is actually one of the reasons why regulations and standards are amongst the major uh, prerequisites for the large scale deployment of these technologies. Um, the focus on electrification and hydrogen was due to the fact that uh, there's a lot happening now on electrification of uh, light duty vehicles and a lot of discussion about the role of hydrogen in, in a clean energy system. Uh, and, and both electrification and hydrogen are some of the solutions which I brought forward when it comes to uh, possibilities to decarbonize trucks. So we thought it was important to look at, uh, at this kind of prerequisite to ensure that anything else can then happen afterwards and, uh, and to focus specifically on, on these technologies which are clearly amongst the, the, the leading solutions if we want to meet the, the goal of the, the Paris Agreement. So I'll get it started on, on the key findings. First, something on, so I'll, I'll go through different aspects that I mentioned earlier, so safety. Um, so when it comes to vehicle safety, probably the reference point is the WP29, World Forum for Harmonization of Vehicle Regulations of the United Nations. Um, normally they develop standards that, well, actually regulations, if they hear me saying standards, they're gonna uh, scream. Um, on the cover um, all road vehicles. Um, so that means cars, light commercial vehicles and heavy vehicles. 
when these are developed at the beginning, normally they, they happen, they, they tend to cover as much as possible for the simple reason of trying to be uh, minimizing the, the burden of, of developing new regulatory texts. Um, but uh, the more we, uh, these, these technologies enter and get close to the market, the more pressing is, is the need to think about diversifying the, the vehicle safety regulation, in particular for heavy vehicles. Uh, it's clear that uh, in some spaces there are gaps. I'll get to the, the, the specifics in, in the recommendations. And, uh, um, and there are specific characteristics of heavy vehicles in terms of duty cycle and emission profiles and, and lifetime that make them uh, different uh, from, from light vehicles and probably, and, and also uh, mean that th th there's, there's a need to think about uh, diversifying the regulatory frameworks uh, for them. Um, when it comes to, oops, next, next slide is about hydrogen refueling. So where do we stand? So the, the reference organization are ISO, uh, International Standard Standardization Organization and SAE, Society of Automotive Engineers. Um, there are uh, regulations on, on refueling, which are to a large extent today focus on gaseous onboard storage. Uh, when it comes to heavy duty vehicles, we're talking about primarily buses and uh, uh, with regulations currently focus on 35 megapascal. Uh, once we want to look into trucks, uh, uh, it's clear that uh, higher uh, pressure and um, are, are better suited, will be better suited, and uh, also ensuring that um, refueling can take place through nozzles which accommodate for higher flows is also another um, requirement, which is not yet ready. Um, there are options in regulatory text about uh, alternative uh, onboard storage solutions. Uh, these include liquid hydrogen, chemical bonding, or swapping. But uh, my understanding is that uh, these are not going to be viable in within the next decade. So we didn't really focus on this part of, or in, in the case of this specific report. Uh, one more point uh, when it comes to hydrogen refueling, there's, there's a need for a very high purity in, in, in hydrogen for using fuel cells. This is not granted, this can be challenging, and this may actually open up uh, growing interest for the use of internal combustion engines uh, to actually be begin the deployment or the growth in demand of hydrogen in, in heavy duty vehicles. For electric vehicle charging, which is um, more relevant for batteries and, and plug-ins, battery and plug-in vehicles, the Standards are developed in the IEC, International Electrotechnical um, Committee, ISO, and SAE. Um, there are two main um, associations, CHADEMO and CHARIN, which have a, law, uh, which have a heavy weight in, in influencing the development of the standards. Uh, the standards have been first originally developed for, for cars, but now there's growing interest and, and quite a dynamic environment in the development of, of standards which are specific to heavier vehicles and therefore subject to higher power. We're talking about one megawatt uh, when it comes to DC charging for heavy vehicles. Um, so, and a lot of progress has been made and is being made because of a very strong interest in, 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 the, in the topic uh, from industrial players and also from regulators. Finally, a word on the electric road system. The progress is also somewhat visible in the case of overhead contact line while there's, there's a bigger gap for, for other systems so far. Um, when it comes to environmental performance, uh, so there's two categories I divided. Uh, first, uh, a discussion on focusing on vehicles themselves. Um, and then in a second one more uh, looking into fuels and uh, vehicle manufacturing. So when it comes to, to, again, a key reference here is the UN, is the WP29, World Forum for Harmonization of, of Vehicle Regulation. Also the, the European regulatory framework is, is an important reference. Um, the key areas which are covered by uh, regulations on environmental performance of vehicles are essentially energy use and emissions. So, and when it comes to emissions, that includes pollutants and greenhouse gases. Um, when, when typically heavy duty vehicles are tested on, uh, they, they're subject to engine testing, but there are, this is also now complemented by um, on-road tests with portable emission measurement systems. Um, 
when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions, uh, the, the regulatory environment is not harmonized internationally. Uh, and it's also uh, rather complex. You need uh, sophisticated simulation tools. Examples are Vector and GEM used in Europe and in the, in the United States or the Harvard in the loop system, which, was, um, which is in place in Japan, was in place in Japan. Um, so I mentioned the fact there's more, uh, there's, a, there's a great stronger need for, for international harmonization and, uh, and also uh, there's no alignment internationally on what is the ambition of greenhouse gas emission uh, reduction targets. When it comes to vehicle manufacturing and fuel production, so important things to say is that uh, one needs to account for um, the full life cycle uh, of, 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 of a truck or a bus. So that means that there are emissions which are embedded in the construction of the vehicle itself. This is especially important in the case of battery electric vehicles uh, and in the manufacturing of their own batteries. Uh, and uh, there are issues related with uh, um, end of life uh, and um, second life eventually that needs to be taken care of. And when it comes to fuels, it's important to look at the well to tank emission, not just the tank to wheel emissions. So uh, zero, zero tailpipe emission uh, is not a zero emission vehicle. So it's important also to decarbonize the, the way fuels are produced, especially in the case of electricity and hydrogen, which do not carry uh, carbon themselves, but may be produced from, from carbon bearing uh, molecules um, upstream. So when, when we focus on, on recommendations, and so things that we saw coming as, as important for, for, for the future, um, so first, it's important to ensure that uh, safety regulations cover all the classes of vehicles, uh, so including heavy vehicles. Um, there is a lot of scope for leveraging on the experience of international regulatory fora, in particular WP29, in the case of, 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 of vehicle safety. Um, there are challenges that are still have to be addressed. They relate with uh, the large size of truck batteries in particular, uh, and then the need to handle uh, issues like thermal runaway and propagation in the case of batteries. Um, there are uh, safety regulations. Um, so there is also a need to ensure that hydrogen powered trucks uh, are, um, the safety regulation currently in place for hydrogen powered trucks are, are properly addressed. There are key issues which are still missing. They relate to the fact that these uh, are vehicles with high lifetime travel and, 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 and therefore a greater, a different type of, of usage profile. Uh, there are currently no uh, requirements in terms of periodic inspections of high pressure vessels. And uh, there are, there's, there are, there's a missing, uh, LM, missing aspect when it comes to um, crash related safety provision. And for example, for rollover, which are important if the the storage is, is placed on, on the top of the of the vehicle itself. That's especially relevant for, for buses in this case. So when it comes to EV charging, um, one key recommendation we have is that uh, the, the subject is, 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 is complex. We're talking about megawatt charging. Uh, this is something that has, is not just about vehicles. It's not just about the, 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 the power system is the way the two interact. Um, Heavy vehicles are, have, a, have a nature of charging, which is kind of, which is, we call it here, mission critical. So not necessarily flexible. Uh, they may need charging at a given point in time and, and, um, and immediately. And so that is something that normally is not well digested by the grid and uh, the power system. So it's very important to ensure there's a good dialogue between uh, the, the vehicle community and, and the power community to ensure that this can be properly addressed. Um, when it comes to e-roads, electric roads, uh, there are also there, so electric roads are one of the solutions that may uh, sidestep the issues or posed by large batteries, but there is a need to ensure in interoperability. There is currently no way to meter the electricity consumption of a truck on, on an e-road and that has to be addressed. And it's important also to develop broader safety specifications. In the case of catenary system, this is, uh, what is encouraging is that there has been quite significant work developed in the rail, rail uh, space. And that is something that can be used as an asset for, for bringing forward the development of regulation and standards uh, for, for, for trucks. When it comes to hydrogen refueling, uh, so I mentioned earlier the need to ensure uh, that there are proper nozzles uh, for high flow and uh, that uh, 
uh, we switch to 70 megapascal when it comes to gaseous hydrogen storage. Um, there is the issue of the fuel quality that I, I mentioned earlier that needs to be uh, ensured. So we need uh, compliance with stringent fuel quality requirements. The report goes into details about what can actually help with that. And uh, um, well, one key thing that emerged, uh, so all this work was benefited a lot from the workshop we had in February. One, one key item that emerged there is the fact that existing transportation infrastructure was not designed to actually host uh, hydrogen vehicles. And there are issues related with the integration of these vehicles with the existing infrastructure. Uh, so these need to be uh, thought through. There's a lot of work, I think, that still has to happen in, in that space. And this relates with fire codes and the use of these vehicles in, in constrained spaces. Uh, the report, again, goes in quite a bit of detail when it comes to that. Um, on the environmental performance, there's a need to harmonize regulation on, on greenhouse gas emissions. I, I mentioned this early. There's also a need to integrate a way to actually measure uh, energy use and greenhouse gas emissions for low and zero emission vehicles. Um, there's a need to fully integrate electricity and hydrogen into policies related with low carbon fuels, which this is not necessarily the case. I mean, there are some cases, some good examples, for example, in California. Uh, but this is not universally uh, available today. So there's a lot of work that has to happen then uh, there. Um, hydrogen powered vehicles uh, uh, need to be tested for non-regulated pollutants. Uh, um, sorry, non-regulated pollutants need to be uh, included in, in the testing or for, for, for pollutant emission and hydrogen powered vehicles need to be integrated into these tests, so engine tests uh, on, on uh, pollutant emissions. So this is, this is currently missing. Um, there's a need to ensure, uh, a, there's a lot of work needed to ensure that uh, batteries are actually used or introduced in a way which is uh, environmentally sound when it comes to, uh, and also in safe or let's say reliable for customers in, in terms of dura durability. Um, there's also a lot of work that's been done in the OCD on the sustainability of battery supply chains, which is, can be very precious in, in this framework, and we talk about that in the report. Um, then we, um, we need... Um, the last point that I have is that uh, one of the ways to promote these vehicles, the low and zero emission vehicles, is to let them get into city centers, for example. Um, and so apply differentiated uh, road access charges uh, in cities. Um, at the moment, this is really developed on an ad hoc basis and it's quite diverse in different parts of, 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 of the world. There is the need to ensure that there's a greater harmonization of the regulatory framework allowing for this. And there is also scope to, to ensure that this can happen through, through, through uh, electronic tolling and so um, that is also another aspect which, which we touch upon uh, in, in the report. I think, unless I'm mistaken, that this should cover all. Um, and uh, thank you all for, for participating to this. And we still have a little bit of time to actually go into questions. And, um, and I would be very happy to, to get any if you, if you have any, if you have any curiosity about specific aspects. That I haven't covered in this 10, 15 minutes. Sorry, Michael, for going slightly overboard with time. Uh, that's okay. That's okay. Um, this is the first time we're doing this series, so we're practicing a little bit, and it's a complex and um, you know topic. Um, I have a question here from from um, IRU from from Aldo Gilasco, who's with us. Hi, Aldo. Very good to have you. And of course, IRU is working on this uh, this as well. And the question is, I'll just read it out. Um, the, we, the IIU, urge the EU to implement a new CO2 methodology based on the well-to-wheel approach uh, in the revision of the regulation and apply to new vehicle, vehicles registered as of 2025. I saw in your report different references to well-to-wheel, but you did not mention it clearly in your final conclusion. Can you clarify? So well-to-wheel. Sure. Um... I think, so in principle, uh, we agree uh, that well to wheel is the way to go. Actually, life cycle is the way to go. Uh, and what I have to say on, on, on a regulation on based on well to wheel, I think a regulation based on well to wheel has um, 
as a challenging aspect, which is the fact that uh, you you need to basically so your regulated entity, typically an OEM, is uh, if you have a tailpipe based regulation, is very clear and is in power of controlling the whole aspects related with 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 what is regulated in this case the vehicle and the and tailpipe emissions. When it comes to well to wheel, you need to regulate at the same time fuels and vehicles because it depends. On, on the way the fuel is produced. And I think as my understanding is that the choice that has been made in Europe is to separate the two topics and regulate separately OEMs on one side with the vehicles and tape pipe emissions. And on the other side, the carbon content of, of the fuels and the fuel quality for, um, for the fuel producers. So um, in a way, the reduction of emissions on a tank to wheel basis is dealt with with the regulations on tank to wheel and then the reduction on the well to tank side is is dealt with uh, on regulations on on the carbon content of fuels when it comes to decarbonization so i think the, the, there are logical justifications for this approach what is what is important is that you make sure that overall the two elements are covered and what is still missing is the part on on vehicle manufacturing and that's why a lot of work is going on to ensure that you also have the characterization of, of in particular, batteries, uh, and when it comes to carbon content of, 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 of batteries. Okay, let me move on to, to because we're getting a lot of questions now, and we want to answer as many as possible. There's one which I find very interesting, which is, uh, will a hydrogen powered bus or truck ever be allowed to go through the Mont Blanc tunnel? And that's obviously a question that relates to this to the safety aspect and that infrastructure is not necessarily adapted to these new propulsion uh, technologies. So I, I don't have a yes or no answer to this. What I can say is that the topic of integrating hydrogen heavy duty vehicles in existing infrastructure was something that emerged as, as, as an area where there's clearly a need for, for greater attention and more work to be developed. Uh, a lot of work is being done in the Netherlands. Um, there are uh, regulations, there are agreements on the transport of dangerous goods uh, that regulate in case, in specific cases, which uh, which do not do not. I mean, these these are, for example, for for hydrogen trucks that would need to distribute hydrogen to refueling stations. They would be su subject to additional uh, requirements. Uh, what I want to say is. I'm, I'm not, uh, I think at this stage, we are not yet in, in a situation where it's gonna be easy to simply use uh, hydrogen powered trucks anywhere. There will be, there is a need for more work to understand what are the risks and uh, more data. And, and, and then based on that, the regulations will be developed further. Uh, and it is, it is important to look into this and, and spend time to, to ensure that we can have a proper framework that will enable safe operation of, of hydrogen vehicles across any type of transport infrastructure. Mm -hmm. This is, by the way, also partly true for, for, for electric vehicles when it comes to thermal, uh, thermal propagation, thermal runaway. So there are, there are challenges there as well. There are challenges, for example, on, on the distances that need to be maintained in depots for buses. Uh, there are fire codes that need to be adapted. This is true both for, for, for hydrogen and for electric vehicles. So, we want to really to flag the need for, for, for a significant body of work to ensure that we can see uh, these low and zero emission technologies deployed on a large scale. Thanks. Um, there's a further question which comes from Gerrit Stumpe, who's, I believe, with, with Siemens, um, regarding the 70 MPA uh, pressure issue. Um, Garrett writes that we see stakeholders like market leader Daimler trucks proposing liquid hydrogen, so cryonic, uh, as the most promising fuel instead of, um, of the 70 MPA. How do you rate this diverging approach, which has an impact on current distribution and filling stations? So what I've seen from the regulatory texts um, that if you, if you basically dig a little deep into uh, the existing UN, uh, UN legislation, you see that uh, the part related with gaseous storage is, is way more developed. There is a component on liquid hydrogen storage, which is ready, but not yet fully integrated in the regulation. So it's a kind of an optional part. Probably the liquid cryogenic storage is, is the next level after the 70 MPA. 
Uh, but we are still not yet um, ready for 70 MPA in, in heavy duty vehicles. And so the first step is to make sure that that happens. There's no, not even a way to ensure that a heavy duty truck can be properly refilled with 70 uh, megapascal. Um, right now, because there's no no nozzle, there's no protocol to do that. So these are immediate needs. And beyond that, so in, in the UN regulatory texts themselves, the, the, the cryogenic storage is seen as a, as, a, as a step which is further away in time compared to, to, to gaseous storage. That's, that's the best answer I can do on this. This doesn't mean that uh, cryogenic storage doesn't make sense or is, is, not, is not ready. What it means is that probably there's more work and more consensus to be achieved to make that part of the international regulatory framework. Thank you. And we have a question from uh, Joseph Kigozi, who asks sort of a very broad question, which I find extremely interesting, namely how applicable are the regulations that, that or the regulatory form that, that we um, develop, that we propose in this form to developing countries, for example, in Africa? Are we just talking about the developed world here? Okay. Um, I don't think this is just about the developed world. Um, of course, there is. Uh, so first of all, new technologies tend to be deployed in 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 countries that uh, have the capacity to ensure the industrial development. But the industrial development doesn't come from uh, nowhere. It comes from the fact that there are there's a lot of work that's been done in the background to ensure that things like these regulatory texts, uh, approvals, ways to 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 ensure that one supplier can communicate with the other, so standards. Uh, have been actually uh, developed and industries be, works a lot with these and governments also work a lot on, on this. So what we're talking about here is something that will matter also for developing countries uh, if they want to have themselves a role to play in terms of becoming part of the productive, so have, uh, have, have an industry that develops in this space. So when, when I think of, uh, of, of um, countries like India, for example, uh, which, is, uh, which, is, which has is important OEM, original equipment manufacturer, so there's an important auto industry. Well, obviously what we're saying here, what we're talking about here is also very relevant for India and for the way its own automotive industry will develop. In the case of Africa, uh, things are currently slightly different. The, the, the extent to which the, the auto industry is developed in Africa is not yet where you see it elsewhere. So the, there's, there's, there's a gap there, objective gap based on, on just the reality of, of, of the industrial, of, of the nature of the industry today. But this doesn't mean that this won't be uh, of any help for Africa. Uh, this will, will become more and more relevant anyway in the forthcoming decades. And, and so I don't see this work as irrelevant for developing countries. I think it's, uh, it's important to anticipate and, and to look forward. I think another point is the, the topic itself though is very complex. And, uh, and so there is a gap, there is a knowledge gap that needs to be filled. Uh, and, and that I believe will take time. And that is also why a lot of this work is actually developed in, 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 in OECD countries to a large extent. Thanks, Pia. I have a final question because we're reaching the end. If you, anyone has one more question, I can take that, but let me ask one question that uh, Alan McKinnon, an old friend of the ITF, has, has posted here in the Q&A. Um, clearly, there's huge need for the international harmonization of low carbon vehicle standards. What are the right forums and mechanisms to achieve this? You've mentioned a few of them, but what are the relative merits and are there others? So I think there are different fora that have different capacities today. Uh, I hope this uh, emerges from, from the report. Uh, I'm convinced that the most relevant fora when it comes to vehicle safety uh, is, uh, is WP29, is the United Nations World Forum for Harmonization of Vehicle Regulation. Uh, I'm also convinced that uh, um, the safety, for example, of, of charging is uh, it's something that needs to be developed in the, in the framework of, of the YEC and ISO, for example. Uh, for that, the, there's the WP29 as a, as, a, as a lower relevance. 
um, simply because it's a different scope. Uh, and then uh, ISO is doing a lot of work across the board. There are, there are also um, standardization bodies, national standardization bodies, re regional standardization bodies. They do a lot of significant work when it comes, for example, to things like guarantees of origin of different forms of hydrogen. Um, in order to ensure that one has a clear idea of whether the hydrogen is, is high carbon or low carbon. So there's not a single form, unfortunately, but there are, there are several and it's important to, to ensure that we can, we understand them well and we can map out who does what so that this type of work can, so, more, so that we can have a good idea of how things are developing in this fairly complex space, I would say. Thank you, Pierre Pablo. I was just saying that um, this this is a long term sub subject. So disruption in uh, regulation is rare and is sometimes not a not a good thing. This needs to be developed step by step and very carefully and keeping sort of different uh, aspects in mind. And this will be with us for a long time. So I think this uh, is certainly the beginning of a discussion, not the end or um, of it. And if any of you who participate in this uh, ask the author session, have more questions that come to you next week or even next month, do contact us. Uh, we're very keen on, on, on engaging with people who are interested in the subject and learning from them, knowing from them and exchanging with them. So um, I would like to, do, to bring this to an end by saying, please uh, come again. And if you, when you leave uh, now, we, you will see a little window with a poll and we'd like to know from you whether you found this useful and you would like to attend another one maybe in the future, just to be able to tweak the format a little bit if you find this too short, too long, too much talking, too less, you know, kind of, so that we can do a little, little adjustment based on, on your needs and your requirements. Uh, thank you all very much. I hope to see you again. Um, you can download the report for free from the ITF website if you haven't done already done so. And I uh, hope you have a good day. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Thank you.